Wow, I, uh, a trifecta of having to follow Jeremy and Steve and have lunch right before. See how many hypo alarms go off during this talk. Um, but it's really an honor to be here at TCOID. I feel like an idiot wearing a suit right now. Um, but my problem is there's people are like, take off your jacket. I only iron this part of my shirt. <laughs> So I will be in a polo shirt right after this. Uh, uh, Steve asked me to talk about advances in artificial pancreas systems, and I've worked in this field of our AP systems before taking on this new role at JDRF for a long time. Uh, so I'll give you guys an update because this is really moving quite nicely. My connection, and you see, uh, you know, the one thing about being an adult with type one running JDRF is uh, we start out at kids, but we grow up. And everybody here uh, uh, is like that. Here's my brother. He was diagnosed back in 77. Here I am in 84 when I was diagnosed. I was 13. I always show this picture and it cracks me up because I always think, if looking like this at 13 wasn't hard enough, just throw diabetes on top of it. It was like kicking me while I was down. Um, so JDRF, again, uh, it's interesting when I talk to adults with type 1 because there's sometimes a love-hate with JDRF, and I'll kind of get into that with the promise of a cure, and I'll talk about it that, that at the end. But that is our goal. That's why we were formed. That's what we're trying to do. Over the last uh, 15 years or so, we've been very uh, focused on making sure people are healthy until we get to a cure. A cure uh, will happen. Uh, I, I won't give you a timeline. But um, so our focus is curing, preventing, and better treating type 1 diabetes and its complications. And we do that through research. We focus on advocacy. I think this is a, another very important slide to me personally. Before I took on the CEO role, I used to head up our research and advocacy because ultimately I always say that we're not successful unless people with diabetes do better. And to do that, research is a means, not an end. Sometimes I worry we focus, uh, we're funding new cool research, and that's great, I'm a scientist, but it doesn't do anything unless you get access. And we have barriers all along the way, as we know, particularly here in the United States, regulatory processes, and right now a lot of health coverage issues, clinical adoption barriers. So we, uh, Many people think of us just funding research, but we have a, a, a very good team, excellent team, working on these other barriers to make sure people get access to stuff. So this is kind of a, like a, just a little paradigm. We focus on curing, uh, also improving lives, uh, working through advocacy, uh, trying to drive as fast as possible. So Steve and Jeremy have highlighted some of this, but this is kind of, a, sometimes it's hard to see progress. My family also started with urine testing. I'm sure there are other uh, folks, based upon a lot of the faces I'm seeing here, who are there. You know, you talk about CGM, and I have families who come up to me and say, I can't believe you live lived before CGM existed. <laughs> like, we lived before blood sugar testing uh, uh, ex uh, was there. How many people use the guillotine? Yeah, oh my God. One of my brothers is an industrial designer, and I say, this goes in the annals of bad industrial design. Hi, I'm gonna poke all the way through your uh, fingernail. You know, it's funny, uh, we often, I, I do diabetes social media and everybody's looking for the unicorn, hitting for 100. But when many of us grew up, it was going for 120. And people say, where did 120 come from? And th these were the strips that I was diagnosed on when my mom re recalls doing that test, uh, she recalls it being black, you know, waiting two or three minutes, getting a color. And when I was fighting for CGM back in the day with FDA and, and some doctors, they'd say, ooh, it's not accurate enough. But look at the, the, the numbers here, 40, 80, 120, it kind of depended on the, your vision. My brother and I seem to see lighter colors than my parents quite a bit. Um, <laughs> Uh, Steve showed this uh, artificial pancreas circa 1964. How many blue brickers are in the room? A few. You know, uh, you'll see it in a slide in a little bit that I talk about uh, the balance between, and I'll show you diabetes, what I call health and happiness. You know, why do you put on devices? And hopefully it drives better glucose control, but it makes your life easier. Uh, the, the people who built this pump, um, I don't know if you know the story, uh, it came from a, a high school student, Dean Kamen, who was building a auto syringe for his brother who was a pediatric oncologist at Yale. 
And his brother wanted to dose chemotherapy over a 24 hour period instead of in injections. So Dean, who still works with us and is an amazing, you've probably seen him on his segways, I and mean, my son's a robotics student, he did first robotics, uh, developed this uh, original pump. And if you look at the team at Yale, who was the first to roll these uh, prototypes out and then commercial systems out, they have pictures of kids playing basketball and soccer, and they're like shorts are like getting tugged down. So, you know, the pumps today, we're always looking for smaller and better, but these are the original ones. This one cracks me up. This is in Dean's uh, lobby at his building in New Hampshire. This is one of the first more commercially available uh, systems. And again, my daughter is uh, in advertising and marketing. And look at the name. If you can't see it, the name of this pump is the Ugly. <laughs> E-U-G-L-Y. And I'm like, that goes in the annals of bad marketing. Oh, check out my new Ugly. How cool is this? <laughs> for euglycemia, like everybody knows that term. Um, and this is the first, I got, I've been showing this for like 15 years and every time I laugh when I see it. Um, this is the first artificial pancreas system, available in the 70s and worked really, really well. The problem is it's the size of a refrigerator, maybe even bigger than most refrigerators right now, and when you use it, you look catatonic. <laughs> Perfect blood sugar control, but uh, not the best uh, form factor. Now here I am in 2019 and I saw all the hands go up with the loopers. Uh, my brother and I have been looping for um, three and a half years now. And uh, I don't wear an eye watch, so it's kind of uh, fake, but my brother does. Uh, bolusing off the watch. I'm bolusing with facial recognition off the cell phone. And I know not everybody uh, knows this well. So we're alluding to it. I'll walk you through what these systems are and what they look like because, God, they, they have changed my life and my brother's life. So Steve talked about the unmet need. Uh, the bulk of people don't get to A1C. We all know this. So if you're at A1C goal, you're doing great. But it is a really, really hard thing to do. And the question uh, is why? Why is it so hard? And my argument is the tools aren't good enough. And that's with all due respect to the companies who are working hard to help us. But most people can't get there. And I've, some of you may have seen, but I'm sure most of you haven't. Uh, one of the things you may get is, you know, you go to the doctor's office, and I know Jeremy or Steve would never say this, but sometimes I've heard it, ah, you, if you just test it a little bit more. Or I had a doctor at the FDA told me, I could get every single type one person to five and a half A1C if they just listened to me. I was like, bullshit. Um, <laughs> So, uh, and, 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 you know, so how do you deal with that? Well, it's, there's data. There is data to show how hard this is. And this is going to look like a technical slide, but I'll walk you through it. Because this slide was one of the most powerful studies that I've ever seen to highlight just how difficult diabetes is. Now, again, it looks technical, but what this study was, was looking at prototype predictive low algorithms that would try to turn the pump down automatically to reduce lows. And the punchline of the study is it works. If you have an algorithm watching your dropping blood sugar and it pulls back and stops insulin, you get low less. It's not rocket science. But the thing that was more interesting to me about this study was the control. So what they did here, and this happened at Stanford and the Barbara Davis Center in Colorado, is they had people go to bed, and there are kids here, but there were adults as well, and all they did is hit an on-off button, and the system would run. But what the way the experiment was done to see if it was really working is on some nights the algorithm would work, and on other nights it wouldn't. It was what we would call randomized. And in this case, you did not know if it was gonna be running. So of course you had to take care to try to not get low overnight. And look at these numbers. On 8% of the nights, and on 5% of the control nights, these uh, kids got below 60 for more than two hours. The adults, 11% of the nights. So this is wearing a CGM, wearing a pump. These people tested eight times a day in this study. They were in a clinical trial, and when you're in a cl clinical trial and know that people are watching you, you do better. At two of the premier centers in the world, 
And once every three weeks, these little ones are going low for over two hours. So tell me, how much harder can you try? So it, it, we need to do better. And this is the last one of the tee up. But this is, uh, let's see, hopefully. This is a, a really, really, again, technical slide, but very, very important, and everybody in here, when I explain, will get it. When closed-loop experiments were being done, one of the things we could do is go back and look and see how much insulin does it take to get your number right. And as uh, Jeremy and Steve have already pointed out, these systems do really, really well overnight. Normalize your number. And then in the day, it depends on your bolusing. But what this group in England showed was the variability overnight of basal rates to get to the number to about between 100 and 120 is 300%. Meaning some nights you might need one unit an hour. Some nights you may need three units an hour. Some nights you may need 0.2 units an hour. So again, when everybody's here trying really, really hard, there is incredible variability here. And the tools we have to date, although we're now moving into a new era, weren't enough to get most people to goal. So automated insulin delivery, that's what we're talking about. There's a term, uh, artificial pancreas, automated insulin, I'll get into that. What I always think about is, you know, why do, uh, why are we going here and what's the benefit? And why do we wear pumps versus uh, do shots? I did shots for 25 years. Uh, ultimately, there's a balance, and I think Dr. Polonsky also hit upon this, is, what does it take? What's the return on investment for wearing an insulin pump? How much do I get out of doing something? If we go out on the promenade, uh, I highly recommend, there's a beautiful promenade around the, the bay here, take a walk at some point, and you see somebody with uh, a pump on, if it weren't the one conference, let's just predict that there weren't 700 type one people walking around. Um, you know, I always say spotting a person with a pump or a sensor on in the wild is like spotting a unicorn. You're like, oh my God, look at that person has type one. I, I was in New York City, I'm digressing here. And there was a, a young lady with the Dexcom on and I pulled out my pump and I was like, hey, and she was like, <gasps> She gave me like, creeper, and I was like, ah, oh, type one, no, sorry, I'm not being weird. Um, but usually, uh, usually you're like super surprised, you're like, oh wow, look at that. Never in the history of man have you found somebody with a pump on who doesn't have diabetes. <laughs> there are a few parents who will try it for their, you know, see what their kids are going through. I've never seen one stick with it. Yeah, I wanna wear this, I wanna poke myself uh, every three days, I wanna get it ripped out on doorknobs. Um, and the point being, uh, we do these things to try to balance our lives, drive better glucose control, but you're making trade-offs. And our goal at JDRF is how do you do both? How do you get your cake and eat it too? Make life easier, make your blood sugar better. And this is where I think artificial pancreas systems are gonna make a big difference and what I've experienced in my three years. Because your blood sugar gets better and you do less. And that's the key part of this equation. So what is an artificial pancreas? People don't like this term, and I, I agree. There is no single artificial pancreas. What we're talking about is making pumps more and more automated. I published a roadmap a while ago that's been alluded to. You know, we're not gonna, I, I love coming to California and seeing the hummingbirds fly around. It's hard to make uh, an airplane fly like a hummingbird. You know, making a machine do what nature evolved over millions of years is hard. But what we can do is add functions that make our diabetes better. And where you're seeing the, the first systems reduced lows, the next ones are now starting to knock off the highs and more and more highs and be closer and closer to what your body used to do. And where we are now is we essentially have hybrid systems out there. And you're gonna, I'm gonna talk about more and more. And then the big question is, can you get to fully automated machines that deal with our diabetes? And how would we do that? So um, there are a ton of systems now coming towards the market. The, I see a bunch of people with 670Gs on. It's been out for almost three years now. Tandem predictive low system is on the market. Tandem hybrid system is very close. They published their pivotal trial 
in, the, in June and it's coming through FDA right now. And then a number of other companies, Insulet, Beta Bionics, Bigfoot, Roche, uh, I'm probably forgetting companies, uh, and I apologize if I am. The, the point being, uh, there are going to, virtually every pump will have automation soon. And that is awesome, so if you wear a pump, it will be, you'll be getting automated insulin delivery. If you do shots, the shots will be built in with smart algorithms. You'll still have to do the shots, but you'll get much more out of the information to help you dose the insulin. So here are a bunch of the systems. I, we've talked about Loop, and I, I use this uh, picture just because I'm doing Loop uh, out in the public. I know this is, uh, as pointed out, it's not FDA approved. It's a DIY system. But it's, it's, um, it's been hugely helpful for me. Uh, you've seen these pictures. One of the things that JDRF uh, has been focused on with this, and you see it on this previous slide, is one of the areas of focus for us is interoperability. I am a big believer that the companies should focus on what they do well and leave other companies to focus on what they do well. Meaning, if you're a sensor company, uh, do sensors. If you're a pump company, do pumps. If you're both, do both. Uh, but if you're Maybe you never developed software. Let somebody else do it. And let people with diabetes pick what's best for them. So one of the projects that we've been focused on with Loop, because it has been hard to get these pumps, is can you bring it above the table and allow for plug and play in the field? So one of the key things that you're gonna see here is plug and play capability. So if you like Omnipod uh, and Dexcom, you know, Omnipod and Dexcom are working together. But in the future, maybe you wanna do Eversense. Or maybe you want to do Abbott. Or maybe you want a different pump. This uh, initiative is trying to take the innovation that's happening in the DIY community and bring it to the app store. And I hope that next year you'll be able to download the first app, loop app that's gone through FDA uh, that will allow for that functionality. F FDA is on board with this. They're allowing the companies now to designate their systems plug and play compatible. Uh, the Dexcom already is, uh, there are a few pumps that already are. So we're gonna see, again, I think in the future, download your app with the algorithm you like, pick the pump you like, pick the sensor you like. Again, I think companies like Medtronic and Tandem, they'll have fully baked systems that may be better for uh, some people, but I'm a big believer optionality is good. So this is Tide Pool Loop, you see Medtronic, Huge news here. Nobody ever thought this was possible. Medtronic allowing, in the future, plugging and playing of their system, which would mean a Medtronic loop uh, Dexcom uh, capability. Pretty amazing. So what is, for the folks who don't live in this world, have never used a pump, never uh, considered hybrid closed loop, what do you get? I think that's an important thing, because we're talking about it, but if you've never done it, what you get is more time in range. It's amazing. My highs and lows are compressed, and if you look at my clarity report, it's, I'm aspiring to be Steve, but uh, one day, one day I'll get there. Um, but it's, you will do better. You will absolutely do better. The number one thing, and Jeremy alluded to this, is sleep. Sleep is absolutely, dramatically improved. Picture how much you spend getting up and peeing, getting up with high numbers, getting up and eating if you have a low, dramatically reduced. It's a godsend. And I've been doing this for three and a half years. To wake up with a number between 100 and 120 every morning, it never gets old. I wake up and I'm like, yeah, sweet. Um, you know, you can imagine you go to the party, you have a few beers sometimes, that's a recipe for lows. This system has just got your back. Uh, less variability, less thinking about uh, type one. Uh, more flexibility. Now, de-skilling is a term that the engineers work, uh, uh, talk about, and Jeremy alluded to this. What does that mean? So uh, a perfect example of this is uh, I went uh, to see my, da my daughter graduated from college this year. And yeah, she's off the payroll, woo! Um, <laughs> so uh, we uh, go out there and I uh, forgot my insulin. I'm like, ah. Uh. 
my, my bag had been stolen that I normally carried around. I got a new bag, I didn't replace my stuff. And right when my pump rang low insulin, I was like, oh crap, I don't have insulin. I refused to pay $300 for a vial for two days knowing I had a huge fridge, yeah. So I bought uh, regular at Walmart. Oh my God. Now, I did regular for a long time. But having done loop and like not paid as much attention to my diabetes, I was like a deer in the headlights. I'm like, how did I do this? What's going on? I'm 350, why won't this blood sugar come down? So it is something that I think we need to remember is as you get more accustomed to the system doing work and it doesn't work, that there is a little bit of a risk that you kind of lose some of the skills you have. What isn't it? It isn't a cure. So anybody who's on a closed loop system, it it still requires you to manage your diabetes. It means you still have to bolus, particularly if you eat carbs, and I too like carbs. Uh, it doesn't mean it's zero work. It will fail, it will turn off, it will, like my, my Riley Link, uh, the battery died, I didn't charge it properly, I thought it was plugged in, it wasn't. Um, it's not autopilot, it doesn't, my A1C is not five and a half. It's lower, but it's not perfect. So again, what we're talking about here is first generations of these systems. But unlike the first generations of pumps, which we know only about 40% of type ones in the US work or use, and I think that's because they didn't deliver enough value in terms of that ROI for a number of people, these systems deliver much more ROI. You cannot do with shots no matter how hard you try, what these systems will do for you. Because you can't stay up 24 hours a day. So it's uh, pretty amazing. Okay, so what's next? Where is this going? One of the things we're focused on, and I'm gonna cover this relatively quickly, is better blood sugar, so knocking off those highs and lows, more automation, and smaller. So JDRF is funding a lot of work and working with companies on very miniaturized pumps, very miniaturized sensors, new ways to deliver insulin, better infusion sets. So these are next generation miniaturized insulin pumps. Uh, some of them are very, very small. They'll use concentrated fast acting insulin. Um, other inputs, so we have Gary here, one of my uh, diabetes idols, Gary Shiner, and he always talks about exercise in type one, and I like to exercise in type, with type one. Um, they're not perfect for exercise yet. They are still other things that we could learn, like I wear a Garmin watch and it tracks my heart rate. What are other signals that could help these systems do better? I was talking to Katie DeSimone, who's a legend uh, in the DIY community, about the impact of uh, insulin sensitivity and walking around in heat. Um, so these signals could probably help make them more uh, uh, easier, uh, better blood sugar and easier to use. More user friendly, like bolusing off the phone to me has been a godsend. Uh, I'm gonna digress and again, talk about that balance between health and happiness. We uh, did a JDRF thing in uh, Princeton, New Jersey at the Novo Nordisk US headquarters a little while ago. And the idea was to tell the employees what it was like to live with type one. So of course, Novo being in the business, they have a lot of type one people, but they have a ton of people who don't have type one diabetes in their families. So we brought in two adults with type one, myself and their chief medical officer who has type one for a long time, and then three young people, eight, 12, and 22. And the 22 year old was asked the question, what was it like to go to high school with type one diabetes? And she started sobbing. And she said, I was bullied. So I stopped bolusing, and my A1C went to 14, and I didn't go to college right out of, uh, away, and I was severely depressed. And, you know, that's just the worst case scenario f to hear about, you know, bullying, and then bullying because of diabetes, it's just horrible. But the, the thing that it made me think of is, like, these little features, and this is where I think these additional things, bolusing off a phone. I'm sure that people, parents in the room who have kids with diabetes know that you know some of them don't want to be recognized as having type one. And I'm sure many of us in this room lived in periods where we didn't want to highlight that we had type one. So bolusing off a phone, which doesn't draw attention to you, is an added benefit. 
And I think we need to think of those things as we develop these next-gen systems. Other drugs, uh, you'll hear about these in the, in the conference. Steve alluded to drugs like uh, pramlantide or amylin. So some of us used uh, the drug amylin or similin. It's hard to use, not the, the easiest uh, drug. But we do know it provides an important biological function. We see in closed-loop studies, when we do insulin and amylin, we can knock almost the complete post-meal high off, which in the future state would mean potentially a no bolus closed loop system, fully automated. So these are things that we're uh, trying to work on, which is fix the high blood sugar side. Uh, we do have some work on implantable systems. You may remember Minimed had an implantable pump. There now are implantable sensors. You should check out the Eversense sensor. Uh, Delivering insulin through the skin is not how the body intended it. And that's the problem with uh, sub-Q insulin delivery. We've heard a couple jokes about the, uh, the Afrezza. I am a huge, I do loop plus Afrezza. Because the effort days are made much, much easier with inhaled insulin. If you want to effort, have blueberry pancakes and, and orange juice, Try use a Frezza because it's a super fast acting insulin, much more physiologic, uh, and knocks down those post meal spikes. Or if you miss it and you're up in the 300s, brings you down super quickly. So the physiology of insulin through your skin is not normal. How do we do this? And one of the ways we're looking at is miniaturized implantable pumps. And then JDRF is funding a lot of work in subpopulations, pregnancy, older adults with type one, new onset type one. All right, so the last little bit, I uh, think I'm right about, I'm at 26 minutes, so I'm on time. Uh, here's the JDRF criticism, the cure. You know, I showed we led, led with the cure. And uh, some people get upset because they were promised a cure is five years away. So what is the future AP system? And is there a cure that's five years away? And why did that happen? So are there any islet transplant recipients in the room? They failed, though. They failed, though. So the reason that people started on this five-year away cure was islet transplantation. And islet transplantation for some people cured their diabetes. So if you go back in time to the JDRF in the 90s when this really started taking off, we would have board members who had diabetes like we've seen with everybody, highs and lows, uh, come to the next meeting and say they were cured. They were islet transplant recipients. And uh, depending on the person, uh, they lasted for a certain length of time. But I was just up in Canada last year with one of the, the foremost people in this field named James Shapiro. He did the Edmonton Protocol. He has people who are still 17 years insulin independent from a single islet transplant. And what that says to me, and what, what it said to JDRF was, it is possible. What happened was, the barriers to islet transplantation were there weren't enough cells, there have only been 5,000 islet transplants ever, there are 40,000 new diagnoses every year, and chronic immunosuppression and rejection were big barriers. But what I can tell you, because I think it's important to, to highlight that this was not intended, it wasn't a fundraising ploy. It was, the, like, I, we have a board member in San Francisco who's been off insulin for 11 years with an islet transplant. If you meet her, she tells you she's cured. So what, what the, the problem we did is we misinterpreted how hard it was going to be to make this real for everybody. And where we are today, and it's not five years away, but Dr. Pettis works in this field, is stem cells replace the cell source problem. And this isn't the cookie, go down to Mexico and get a stem cell treatment. This is real stem cell biology growing up and making insulin and curing monkeys and pigs right now. Not people, but big animals. And then the protection. So the last little bit I'll, I'll finish with is there are a number of companies now, the real artificial pancreas is nature. It's using cells. It's islets. And that's where we're headed. And I won't tell you how long, because I don't know. But I do know that in the next 
two to three years, there will be multiple companies in human clinical trials. There are kind of three different approaches, what we call macro encapsulation, Dr. Pettis has worked on this, like Viacite, which is based here in San Diego. They're putting little packets of cells under your skin. Stem cells grow up, they make insulin, they're protected from the immune system by this package. Think of like a shark cage. Shark normally eats the person who swims in the water. You can protect them with the cage. Immune system uh, is the cage. There are also like a DRI, the bio hub. Um, there's an amazing project going on right now with Eli Lilly, and this gets to Jeremy's point. Is there a conspiracy against cures? No. The problem is it's just hard science, but the company who cures diabetes will make money off of it, and that's okay. And what they're trying to do is the, be the first person to get there. So right now, Novo, Lilly, and Sanofi all have major stem cell-derived islet programs. This is micro-encapsulated cells, where they spray coat the cells and then they're injectable. Really, really cool project, Just getting close. So see, no unlimited cell source. Everybody, it would not be limited to uh, transplants. Um, and then no immunosuppression. And then, you know, who's making these materials to protect from the immune system? We are scouring the world to figure out how you can protect these cells. This is a partnership JDRF is working on. Lockheed Martin. So most people here in uh, San Diego, you think of the military, works with Lockheed Martin. Crazy investment into material science. Now being applied to medicine. And we're working with them where they can create super small, they call them graphene uh, uh, vesicles that allow nutrients and oxygen to keep the cells healthy in, but the immune system out. So the ultimate artificial pancreas, we're all going to hopefully move into these devices. I'm benefiting from it now. Um, but the goal for JDRF is to change that into cell uh, artificial pancreases. So I always uh, now fast forward, we're all adults here with type one. Here's my brother, 41 years later, he's, uh, I'm going golfing with him uh, Monday and Tuesday and then he's going to Sonoma to do a JDRF ride 100 miles, 41 years of diabetes later, might be 42 now, uh, and he will almost certainly be in the first group that comes in biking at about 23 miles an hour uh, for 100 miles, which is amazing. And uh, here I am uh, running the New York City Marathon, which I've done seven times, and I've run 20 uh, marathons. I always, you know, it, I think it's a fine balance of how hard diabetes is, and then showing the next generation that you can still do amazing things. Thank you. <laughs>